attention, everyone. I have a quick but important announcement to make. It's also top secret. Well, it's top secret in that Jimmy doesn't know. He doesn't know that I'm slipping this into the podcast. Next month, uh, June 2022, is Jimmy's 40th birthday. His wife is planning a party, and we would love to give you the opportunity to be a part of celebrating Fofo's Big 4-0 by sending Jimmy an actual birthday card or a handwritten greeting. Like I said, he does not know that we're doing this, so it's important that you keep this on the down low. Don't tweet about it. Don't mention it to Jimmy. But if you appreciate the podcast, if you appreciate Jimmy, then we would love for you to send him a card or a note. Here's how you'll do it. Send the card or the note to me, Make sure the envelope is addressed to me. The card, of course, is for Jimmy. Send it to me, Joe Thorne. And the address that you can send it to is 1125 Oak Street in St. Charles, Illinois, 60174. You've got the whole month of May to do this, maybe even the first week of June. But after that, it's going to be too late. So if you want to participate, go get a card, write the note, send it in, and we will let you know how it goes after we surprise Jimmy. Thanks for listening, and thanks for your support. Welcome to Doctrine and Devotion, the podcast that explores Christian faith and practice from a Reformed Baptist perspective. My name is Joe Thorne. I'm the lead pastor of Redeemer Fellowship in St. Charles, Illinois, and Jimmy is in Europe as we're recording this. Uh, I don't know exactly where he's at. Uh, I don't know exactly know what he's doing. I just know he's super busy, and uh, I only get to talk to him when he's hopping off one train, getting onto another, uh, right before he's trying to go to bed, uh, and then getting up early and going. He's He's doing all kinds of business stuff. So uh, while he's gone, uh, I'm just talking to people. And uh, and today, we're bringing on a guy named Jordan. If you're on the social media, if you're in our world on Twitter, then you've definitely encountered uh, Jordan Stefaniak. Uh, Jordan is actually the, one of the founders and the president of uh, the London Lyceum. And uh, he's a research fellow at, uh, at Southeastern. Is that correct? Yep, yeah. that's right. And uh, you're doing your PhD at the University of Birmingham? That's right. All right. In the UK, not in Alabama. Yeah, no. <laughs> right, right. So, uh, Jordan, thanks for coming on, man. Thanks for making the time. Yeah, man, this is uh, this is a pleasure. It's an honor, and it's it's all those things, though. I am a little bit bummed that your better half isn't here. Um, I know to be able to banter with him. I know, I know. It's it's you're 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 getting the 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 lesser half, the shorter half, but the smarter <laughs> half of uh, <laughs> of the duo. Uh, we do miss Jimmy, and um, hopefully he'll be well. Who knows, man? He he's because he's trying. He's traveling in between these these countries. Uh, you know, some of them are easier for him to get into than others, and it just kind of depends. So uh, with all of the restrictions that various places have, so he may be getting back sooner or later. But he will be. With me, we will be together at the Southern Baptist Convention in Anaheim. So uh, well, we will be there. That's going to be a party. <sighs> Bro. <laughs> what Gosh. the heck? I mean, it, it, this whole... Yeah, anyway, I'm bringing on Krista McDunn, uh, one of our members uh, at Redeemer. She's a strong Reformed Baptist lady, counselor, professional counselor. Uh, we're going to talk about some of that stuff uh, this week as well. So if you're listening to this, um, yeah, tune in later this week. Uh, Krista and I will be chopping it up on the report. Yeah. Okay. So Anaheim, I'm just not looking forward to it. I'll tell you what I am looking forward to. I am looking forward to hearing you talk about the London Lyceum, uh, what a lyceum is, and uh, John Gill Project, all this stuff. Yeah. Why don't you tell our people, in case they're unfamiliar, what is the London Lyceum? Yeah, well, uh, I guess uh, as a longtime listener, I, I got, I'll take, I'll try to explain everything as best I can on my first time here. Explain it like, so you're, talking, Lyce- explain it like you're talking to Steve McCoy. Okay. So Who doesn't understand right. things. So I'll think bottom shelf Steve McCoy. Right. Just because I know that he needs to understand. I know the rest of your listeners Good. are higher top shelf. So I, I, I understand that. So the London Lyceum, essentially, it began as a podcast like three years ago between me and my friend Brandon Askew. Um, it, for the longest time, I told myself I'd never do a podcast just because, you know, the, the stigma, all the stuff that goes along with it. But then it sort of just happened. And, 
we started talking about thinking like, what would we do? What would we actually talk about that would bring benefit that not everybody else is doing? Mm -hmm. Um, Both of us were philosophy sort of minded guys. So we decided, you know what, we're reformed Baptists. Uh, We also love philosophy. There's not a lot of reformed philosophy that's going on out there. So we tried to combine these things together, which is where you get the two words from. So London would be the second London confession. So championing our heritage, our Baptist reformed heritage. And then the Lyceum is Aristotle's like version of the Academy. So Mm -hmm. a lot of people know the Academy, Plato's Academy. This is just, it's sort of a, a, it's supposed to be a place of intellectual stimulation and debate. So we're trying to bring these two things together, which is where you get the analytic theology, Mm -hmm. the Baptist theology, and the confessional theology. The analytic stuff is sort of the philosophy um, area. We can talk more about that if you want, because some, I get that question a lot, you know, what is analytic theology? And I'll try to explain it as best I can. For the most part, I think there's two things that you need to have analytic theology. One is clarity. So if you read something that's clear, that oftentimes they're going to explain their arguments with like syllogisms. So instead of just putting everything in a paragraph, they're going to break it out and say, okay, here's step one, here's step two, here's step three, here's step four. I think that's helpful because then you can be like, I don't like step two. That's where I think you're wrong. So it makes the debate a little bit easier. And then the other aspect is usually, oftentimes, analytic theology is going to borrow from analytic philosophy to assist in explaining uh, various doctrinal positions. Mm. So, for example, I have a paper on uh, multi-site churches that I wrote for a journal. And essentially, I tried to argue against them with the usage of social group theory that is part of analytic philosophy and say, look, if we borrow from this, we can have another argument against multi-site churches. So that's sort of mm. the idea behind it. We're just trying to so borrow from these things. It sounds are, to it sounds to me like um, that you're saying philosophy matters. And I, you know, for me, I just think like Bible. All I need is the Bible. I don't know why I need philosophy. And uh, and if there's one thing better than one site. Of a church, it's multiple sites. So I don't understand where you're coming up with this stuff. This is what I think happens when you when you bring philosophy into the mix. You start confusing people with words like Lyceum, and then all of a sudden you're like anti-church all of a sudden. So could you explain? And if you're new here, I'm joking, guys. Um, why? I, I mean, because you really and keep it at a really simple level, and then yeah. you can go deep from there. When somebody, because I know a lot of people do, why would I need philosophy to read the Bible? Why would I need the philosoph- philosophy to understand God? God's given me his word. Can't I just read his word? Yeah. What's up with philosophy? How do you explain that to them at the entry level and then press in deeper? So first thing I want to say is I was of that mindset for a long time myself. So when I say that you need, you should and need typically need philosophy, it's not, it's not like a necessary condition for understanding understanding things but it is a useful aid. So I just want to clarify, I also thought philosophy, that stuff just corrupts all your theology. Mm. So that was like, when I first became a Calvinist, I was like, oh man, all philosophy does is try to tear down Calvinism and all these things. And that was sort of my mindset. I was in a little bit of a cage stage, which you can be in a cage stage a, a lot of things. Oh, so yeah. it's not just Calvinists who go cage stage. You can find it all across the spectrum. Um, but so with that in mind, What changed my mind is when I started to understand, I guess, two things. First of all, the breadth of philosophy. So when we say philosophy, we don't necessarily have to say you have to be using Aristotle's four categories to explain this. It can mean all sorts of things, just like using basic logical skills to make an argument. That's part of what philosophy is. It's a very broad thing. However, it's also just a useful tool and aid to understanding Scripture. You don't need philosophy to become a Christian. You don't need philosophy to understand basic facts about God. But it's a useful tool and aid. It's not authoritative in any sense. It's not as if you read Scripture and then you have philosophy and, well, well, I have philosophical problems with this. Therefore, I get to deny Scripture because of that. That's not what you get to do. But it does help you understand and defend what's actually there in the biblical text. So I find it as, you know, there's, I guess the terminology that often gets used would be scriptures like has a magisterial rule while philosophy and other things uh, has a ministerial rule where they, they're ministers serving the scriptures, Mm. helping to build it up, helping to explain it. So that's why I would think that philosophy is something you need 
uh, when you're thinking about the Bible. Everybody's doing it. Everybody. You are doing philosophy when you are reading the Bible, whether you realize it or not. Right. That's why it's helpful to just recognize it and say, I actually am going to call it out and say, yes, I am using this. I'm going to be transparent and honest. Instead of pretending it's not there, because when you do that, you become unaware of your own presuppositions, which is more problematic. Right. So that, that this is what I've tried to explain to people is that you know, everybody has a philosophy, whether it's clearly defined or not, whether yeah. you've studied philosophy or not, you have a worldview with presuppositions and methodologies with which you approach the things that you That's take right. in. And so the more you understand what those things are, the better a philosopher you are. And yep. then you can evaluate, oh, you know what? This presupposition that I have is whack. I got to get rid of that thing. It doesn't work anymore. But if you're going into it blind, it's just, oh, I'm just a blank tablet and the Bible is just truth and it's going to be imprinted on my brain without any error or interpretive you know, measures taken, uh, you're, you're going to get into a lot of trouble. I, so I think that that's helpful. And so the, the London Lyceum is really your attempt. Like, so we keep it simple here. We, we like, we like to do doctrine and devotion is, is fun entry level for reformed right. Baptist thinking. That's what we like to do. Keep it simple. Keep it fun. Cause there, at the time, nobody was tr- even trying to do that. It was preaching and teaching lectures, but nobody was just talking and goofing around and having fun, but being thorough and in, like introducing people to stuff. And so we thought, you know, well, let's do that. And so I love that people are finding different avenues and emphases with um, with bringing Reformed Baptist thinking uh, and Reformed thinking more broadly uh, into the, the the public consciousness. Right. So you're you're emphasizing the. Uh, a philosophical and a, really a deeper dive into mm-hmm. a lot of the things that are oftentimes neglected. Uh, I think that's really good. With the London Lyceum, you you, you have a podcast, are, yep. but are, are you guys publishing? Or do, are you? I, I saw something about so, the John Gill Project. Yeah, so I'll walk you through the different things we're doing, and I think you're right. We're not trying to aim for the like. If you had like four shelves of like where people are at with their intellectual abilities or interests. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, tip, like if you're in a church, you'd want to try to hit everybody. Sure. But for us, we have just intentionally said, we are going to try to shoot for the top two shelves. Essentially, we're going to drop some crumbs down there to the bottom and say, yeah, I think you should join and be interested. I mean, Brandon's grandma is our most loyal listener. Nice. Um, she loves it. So we, we try to communicate in a way that everybody can understand, but we don't apologize for just going ahead and just aiming for that niche right. because we think that area is helpful and needed. Yep. Um, as far as what we're doing, so we've got a podcast. Uh, we have been trying this new format of like live two hour roundtables where we try to bring together different opinions on different topics. So we just had one on political theology, pro- uh, Protestant political theology, and it went really well. Uh, that will be on YouTube as soon as I can figure out how to finish editing it all because I didn't realize making YouTube videos was as time intensive and as difficult as it actually is. So I'm working on that. Uh, we got a couple more coming up. One on classical theism, which I think would make sense for your listeners if they're interested yeah. in that. We've got some of the top scholars in the world who are going to be talking about this. And then we've got one on covenant theology coming up too this year. We also have, I mean, we've got a website with like online articles and book reviews and those sort of things. Um, but we also have a, a new project that we started. You mentioned the John Gill Project. So... Essentially, the project is designed to republish and promote and, pu- and make John Gill popular again. So we think we think us, the Andrew Fuller Center for Baptist Studies with Michael Haken, and then H&E Publishing, who's going to be the one publishing it, we all think that John Gill is super helpful mm-hmm. and has a lot of really help. Like, he's got some weird stuff, like sure. no doubt about it. Uh, but on the whole, he's an extremely helpful thinker for Baptists. Mm. And so we realized if people want to get access to John Gill stuff, I mean, most people end up going on Amazon and they're like, there's nothing for John Gill. Like if I want to read them, where am I going to find them? And if they find like the bad standard bearer, which is fine, I've got the volume. Um, it's like this tiny, 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 tiny little print. Yeah. So your church members are not going to read it. And a lot of pastors can be like, I don't want to read this. So if we want to make him accessible to a new generation and say, this is a useful resource that we think would, benefits your own ministry and benefits your people, we've got to put it in a context that is actually accessible and readable. So we're tra- transcribing his work 
and republishing it in different formats. So the first one volume that's going to come out is an abridged and edited version of his systematic theology, which is massive. So uh, if you have his Herman Bavink, it's his body of divinity. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have Herman Bavink on the shelf or Francis Turton or John Calvin or something like that, Calvin's got two volumes. If you were to take all of Gill's, it'd be like three volumes the size of Calvin. Um, so it's a lot of material. We're going to yeah. condense that into one volume that'll release in January. But we've got plans for an unabridged three-volume set of that as well, plus other small sections of his material in one-volume readable formats mm. that pastors can engage, that they can use for their churches, they can do book studies on it, those sort of things, because we think Gill is a helpful thinker. And for me, a lot of my favorite theologians in the Reformed faith are not Baptists. Right. And I think, well, I'm a Baptist. I feel like I would want someone who's both Reformed and Baptist. But well, we have that in John Gill. It's yeah. just not accessible. So we partner together. We do need support. So if your church is interested in supporting this project, you can go to LondonLifeScene.com, hover over the resources tab, click the John Gill project, and you can donate to that. If you donate certain amounts, you'll get certain volumes sort of thing. It's, it's basically... It's funding the copy editing and mm. all of the work that goes in on the stuff that yeah. none of us have the ability to do. Type you setting. Need professionals. Yep. You need professionals to do it. So we have to pay them a certain amount for each volume. And so we're basically just saying, can you help fund this so that we can actually have this accessible to other churches? Because we think it's going to pay a lot of dividends. I'm so excited about this. And I'm glad you're going about it this way. Because, you know, in theory, you could partner up with, you know, some publisher or you know quote unquote publishers there are yeah there are so-called publishers out there that are not really publishers that are publishing books and you know the typesetting is bad the margins are bad you know it, the, the, there's terrible distribution there's it's just it's yeah i would rather see people hire your own crew and then knock it out and and yeah. get it get it together so i'm really excited i love that you're doing john gill um i remember i i uh i was introduced to john gill I was introduced to all of these guys when I was, uh, or most of these guys when I was in Bible college, because I was already a Calvinist, you know, in general, um, and exploring Reformed theology, and was, of course, reading all the Pado baptists because that's what you do. Yeah. That's what we have. You know, most of our guys fell into obscurity. And so, um, and then I, I don't even know, I, I don't remember how I got, this is before the internet. So, like, I got... Somehow I got a copy of John Gill's Body of Divinity from the library at Moody Bible Institute. And uh, and I checked it out. And then as soon as I could, I got myself a copy of that Body of Divinity, Doctrinal Divinity, Body of Practical Divinity. Yeah. And um, and eventually I did find some stuff from like, well, hold up. This is weird, right? Like, you know, some of his stuff on justification, like eternal justification, yeah. whatnot. But uh, I absolutely loved it. And... Like, and then I, I, I started to research him more like Gil, you correct me if I'm wrong, right? Cause you'd know better than I do. Was there a better Hebrew scholar in his day than John Gill? <laughs> well, let's be clear. I'm not a historian either. Uh, but as far as I know, no, right? it's incredible. The amount of knowledge that he amassed when he didn't even have access, he couldn't go to Cambridge. He couldn't right. go to Oxford. He's right. not allowed. He's a Baptist. Yeah. And yet he has this incredible skill with Latin, with Greek and Hebrew. I'm like, and he's a pastor, a loyal pastor, mm -hmm. and stayed at the same church for 50 years. I mean, it, I think he's an incredible uh, example and model to follow. I love that, you know, and a lot of people point this out, or not a lot, of, I've heard people point this out before that, you know, uh, in a, in a, in a, the difference between him and Calvin, and there are many, but like one of the things that people have pointed out is, is well, you know, Calvin wrote his you know, his uh, Institutes of the Christian Religion and then wrote his commentary, whereas Gill wrote the commentary on every book yeah. of the Bible and after that wrote his Body of Divinity, which that's, right. that's the way to do it. That's just so great. Which, the cool thing about the, his commentary on the whole Bible, I think I'm getting my facts right, is the first English commentary on the whole Bible. And then his systematic theology is the first complete Baptist systematic yeah. theology. So I'm like, dude... You, Who's better than Gill as a, like, if right. you're a Reformed Baptist, you want to have Gill on your team. Yeah. You know, if you're an assembling a, a basketball team, Gil, Gill's right there. And you shouldn't be, wor listen, okay, so so he's wonky on some stuff. Okay. Well, you know what? The Reformed community in general can pull good out of Richard Baxter, and he had a lot more wonky stuff going on than Gill. And we all read Pado Baptists. So, like, I, like everybody needs to chill. It, but it, it's the same thing with, 
Oh man, with Thomas Aquinas, I guess, right? Like, no. you know, you can't read Thomas Aquinas because if you agree with one part, you have to agree with the whole. Otherwise, you're being inconsistent or whatever. And it's just, that's not how things work. Um, that, so maybe we could talk a little bit about, about that um, here. Uh, there's, you know, we had Richard Barcellus on recently. And of course, you know, he's the hermeneutics guy, Reformed Baptist guy. Um, and we wound up talking a bit about some of the issues that, that are surrounding the, the, this discussion and, and debate around Thomas Aquinas and, and classical theism. Um, but maybe you could put a finer point on some of these things for us. When, when, people, yeah. are, when people are talking about classical theism, maybe, could you explain that? Like, what is theism and then what is classical theism? Why do we need that modifier? So classical theism as a term is relatively recent. So like you're not going to go back and read uh, Calvin and see him talking about classical theism all over the place, but that doesn't mean that it's not there. So typically when I, when I want to talk about classical theism, that is a particular thesis about the nature of God. And there's really four, I think, unique things that classical theism all has in common. That's one. It affirms a strong version of divine simplicity. Now, I do think there is a little bit of leeway in how you construe that. Um, There is an emphasis on divine impassibility. That means that God can't receive sort of action. Like, he's not going to have, number one, he's not going to have passions. He's not going to have negative emotions. And he's not going to receive any action, external action. So cashing that out a little bit is, is difficult because I think most people in the church are like, if you ask somebody in the pew, is God impassable? Does that mean, can God receive action from me? They'd be like, well, yeah, I pray to him or I do these other things. That doesn't mean he's not impassable. You'd have to make some fine distinctions there. Right, right. Uh, the other two are immutability, meaning God cannot change. And then that God is timeless or eternal, which means he's, for the most part, he doesn't, he's, he's outside of time. He doesn't have he doesn't have any temporal duration. It's not as if he's getting older with each passing year. Um, those are the four things that are distinctive about classical theism. There's a lot of other stuff that classical theism is going to affirm. God is omnipresent. Right. God is omniscient. God is which you know he's he's everywhere. He's all knowing and he's all powerful. But that's you can have other you can have what's called neoclassical theism, which would either modify significantly or reject all all four are part of those four initial attributes, but they're going to affirm omnipresence, omniscience, omnipotence. They're going to affirm those sort of things, omnibenevolence, that God is all good. And then you can go down the list between, you know, process theism is going to affirm some things and not others. But classical theism, what makes it distinctive are those four particular attributes. Now there's a lot of stuff that goes into classical theism, like how you read scripture, the hermeneutic piece, um, which is what I think often is the discussion more than anything, at least now, is right. the hermeneutics piece. People aren't actually debating the nature of simplicity as far as I can see. They're all debating what is the role and authority of Scripture and how does it play into this discussion. Right, right. Okay, so so but as I'd like to hear you on, on hermeneutics a bit here, but so, you know, theism, right, um, is... I mean, summarize that, right? So theism is, is, is a, is a concept of, of, of God. God exists. God exists. And it's, it typically it's, a uh, it's dealing with theology proper. It's, um, nature attributes of God and, uh, it's, it's monotheism. It's, it's, it's fairly, well, or is it not? So when I think theism, I just think about the distinction between an atheist and a theist. Okay. So it so can like, be very broad. In- Oh, yeah, super broad. So, like, I'm in the UK last week, and one of the first, uh, there's a new philosopher in the program, and the first question he asked me is, Are you a theist? So, just so you know, like, that's sort of the context that I like operate in a lot of the time. That the the description there is, Are you, do you believe in God or not? So, classical theism is just saying, you know, there's a classical view about God. But yes, you're right. So, the doctrine of God, the attributes of God, um, and that's in the Christian context. So there's Christian yes. theism, like there'd be other kinds of theism. And then within Christian theism, you're saying classical theism is is a a very more specific form of it. And how far back yeah. does that go? This classical well, form of theism. I mean, you know, as, I mean, in, in terms of it being articulated, not as classical, but in yeah. these doctrines that have been seen well, as important. Well, I mean... I don't think anyone would dispute at all that classical theism exists from the very beginning of the church. Um, 
Now, some people are going to debate, well, what does the text of Scripture actually say? Okay, that's fine. We, we can debate that. But no one debates at all that people like Augustine right. and others, when you get to the three to four hundreds, this, this Nicene sort of culture, no one's debating that they're classical theists. Right. What people end up debating is, are they actually interpreting Scripture correctly? Right. So, so classical theism, they're all the way through through the medieval period. Now, there's a lot of variation. There's a lot of distinction. Some people put together things a little bit differently, but mm-hmm. this broad sense that God is simple, he's unchangeable, he's He's timeless, these sort of things, he, he exists without time. Like, that's all pretty consistent for the most part. You see this consistency mm. throughout Scripture. I do think there is some room to push and to, to mold some things. And I know I, I get in hot water when I say that thing with the, the cage stage classical theists. I do think there's some space, but for the most part, that's the consistent theme that you see going yeah. through. Uh, that, that sounds fair. And just so to put this to bed and move on, like I've just seen people online arguing about the, even the term classical. And so let me break it down like Joe style. Right? This is how I'm going to explain it to people. <laughs> if I were, so like when I was a kid and I went to the store and I was like, hey, give me a Coke, um, they'd give me a Coke. But in 1985, 86, if I were to say, hey, give me a Coke, it didn't taste the same anymore. It was new Coke. And so Coke had changed. They had, the recipe had changed. Mm. Well, a, a few years after that, they were like, hey, we really screwed this up. Let's bring back classic Coke. So the, they had mm. classic Coke, which was the old Coke, but now it has this modifier on it so that everybody knows what it is. It, so I think people that embrace classical theism are simply saying like, yeah, we're, we're identifying what it is in contrast to what it isn't. And these other mm. ideologies and theologies that have come along since this was sort of a, 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 an established understanding of God, at least among uh, certain segments of the Christian church. Is that fair? Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, I get a, get a little dicey when people like just throw everything in the modern period in the dumpster. Cause I'm like, well, right. you've got Herman Bavink, you've got yeah. Louis Burkhoff, you've got all these awesome dudes who mm-hmm. are here too. So let's, let's not just throw everything out and just say modernism is bad. There's right. lots of really good stuff in there, but there is a decided shift where there is a, a, a clear majority. And then when you get to the 17th, 18th century, people start to rethink things and question things, and it does become less of a majority. I still think it is the majority few, because even if you go to all the large denominations of the church today, you still find this codified in their confessional documents. Mm-hmm. Now, whether their pastors and theologians believe it, right. that might be another matter, but it, it's still definitely the majority view. And so we have at least from my perspective, right, from my, you know, and my perspective is, I don't know how, how, uh, how wide it is because I'm very focused on my local church. I, I, yeah. I don't, I just don't give myself much time for a lot outside of it. Um, but my, my take is, is that Baptists, the confessionally reformed Baptist community are the ones that are really championing a lot of these classic views, um, writing, teaching, um, and a lot of it, from what I'm hearing you say and what I'm seeing, a lot of it does come down to hermeneutics, um, right. you know, how we understand the scripture, how we interact with it. What what are some of the issues that are that are muddying the waters when it comes to hermeneutics? Hermeneutics being the the art and the science of interpreting scripture, is the way some people would put it. Um, so, what what is it? That because we obviously we could spend you know semesters studying what hermeneutics is, but what is complicating or muddying the waters of interpreting scripture today that uh, you see happening in this discussion around classical theism? So I think there's there's two things. One we can talk about a little bit is a misunderstanding of the sufficiency of scripture, and then the second thing is just an incipient sort of biblicism. So when I say biblicism, I see it I sounds like a most, good word. That sounds like such a good that's word. Right. How could you be against biblicism, you dummy? Biblicism that's sounds right. amazing. That's exactly right. <laughs> and there is a sense in which, yes, if if it really actually just meant we're Bible people, that's good. Sure. It sounds like a pious word, but it's actually a very technical term that's mm-hmm. used for people who want to read scripture in a way that's completely insulated and divorced from anything else. Mm. So we can't allow anything to influence or to potentially change our interpretation of Scripture. I have to be almost like in a 
you know, lock myself in a cell and be alone with nothing. I can't have anything influence me because then that would potentially dethrone the supremacy of Scripture in some sense. And you find this in almost every single evangelical who wants to revise the doctrine of God and say, I don't like classical theism here and here and here. It's almost always because of the hermeneutics, Hmm. because of this biblicism, because they look and say classical theism, they just take this philosophical, philosophical framework and they just drop it over the text of scripture and force scripture to mean what they want it to mean. That's why they're wrong. So I did my THM thesis on this very topic. So it, it, I see it all over. You see it in Bruce Ware. You see mm-hmm. it in Scott Oliphant. You see it in their writings. Now, maybe they change their views at some point, and I'd say, praise God. I, I think you made a, a good move. I don't have a problem with them as people at all. I sure. have a problem with their positions. I had Ware as a professor, and yep. Ware was easily one of the most captivating professors that I had. I disagreed with a lot um, because I'm confessionally reformed, but he was eminently enjoyable and seemed like an awesome guy. <laughs> That's right. He's... I have no doubt that he's a godly man. I don't know as, as a professor too, and he seemed to emanate kindness, yeah. care, enthusiasm, all those virtues. Yep. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I think he's wrong. Yes. Um, and that, and I think we as Christians should be able to handle that properly, yeah. where we can say you're dead wrong. I can still be friends with you. Right. I can still treat you with respect and kindness because that's what Christians do. Yeah. But I can still think I think you're dead wrong here, and so I think. Almost always, 98, 99% of the time, reason people want to revise classical theism, at least in evangelicalism, is because of this biblicism. Now, I am going to pull up an article that I have in Modern Reformation, the latest one, and I'll give you the definition because... The, oh, yeah, you, know, you got in my, trouble for this, I think. I, I got in trouble for <laughs> for one of my quotes, which... Thanks, thanks, like, thanks Richard. <laughs> Didn't Richard Look, quote you? <laughs> Is that what happened? Yes, he did. So Rich quoted me because, you know, he likes to be funny on Twitter, did but he, he, did he, he quote actually you? liked the quote. Did he quote you and yes. go, hmm, did he do that? <laughs> I don't remember if he did that. He might have. And then Owen Strand retweeted it, and then James White got a hold of it. Um, those, which, were not, those were not sympathetic retweets. No, they were not. Um, in, interesting nonetheless. So I'm not going to go down that route right now. I'm going to just talk about biblicism. And in this article, and I'm not pretending that I've written everything to be as clear as possible. Sure. Maybe I said something in a way that does, like is not helpful. But here's, I think this, I do think this helps. So I think there's two senses of how we should think about um, biblicism. And the first one is, Let's take scripture is authoritative. This is just what biblicism would be. It's authoritative for all of our concepts about God, Uh, whether that's, you know, morality, whether that ends up being anthropology, those things too. Uh, But we're just talking about God right now. Right. Therefore, theological commitments must emerge from scripture alone and be consistent with scripture. So anything else, whether that be creed, whether it be confession, tradition, intuition, philosophy, whatever it is, that's incompatible with the sem- supremacy of Scripture. So what I think Biblicism is doing is saying it has to be alone. It can't have any other sources influence it because then that would deny the supremacy of Scripture. And I just, or deny sola scriptura. But that's not even what sola scriptura means. That's right. So I think there's two problems with it. Number one, it's literally impossible to do. Right. Number two, it's not consistent with how the Reformed tradition has understood sola scriptura. Yeah. So... If you want to disagree with the Reformed tradition, fine. I'm not going to lose sleep over it. I'm not going to cry about it, whatever. But let's be clear. That's not what sola scriptura means. So that's why you'll find people making distinction between sola scriptura and solo scriptura, Mm. where they're trying to just say there's this sense where you're rejecting all these other methods to help you understand what Scripture says and trying to do it by yourself because you're afraid that these other things are going to uh, influence it and almost have authority over it. But that's not what Sola Scriptura is trying to say. It's saying, Sola Scriptura says Scripture is authoritative. Everything has to be consistent with Scripture. Yeah. That means all other sources must be consistent with it and complementary to it. And but subordinate they still to function, it, yeah. They still function with, you know, authority, a, a derivative authority, right. secondary authority. Yeah. And that's okay. Well, the confessions articulate that very thing. That's right. It's, it's, they're not vague at all. 
about it. It articulates it over and over. It yeah. talks about using the light of nature yeah. over and over. So it it's affirming natural theology within the mm-hmm. confession. Right. Right. Okay. So, so a part of this, a part of the hermeneutical mess is, is biblicism, which is yes. the idea that like, I can read the Bible without any outside influence, philosophy, yes. or, you know, I don't know what, how else you would put that. Right. But I can, I, I can only derive concepts of God from scripture and there really is no supplemental help available yeah. to me. Just the spirit and the word, which sounds, man, I mean, it, it sounds like Quaker, charismatic, you know, old school yeah. enthusiasm. It's like, it's just, it's, it's, it's weird that I'm, we're seeing it in some, I don't know if I'm, we're seeing it in reformed, you know, certainly I don't, I mean, maybe we are, you can tell me, I'm not experiencing this in the confessional community as much as I'm seeing it in the Calvinistic kind of you know, yeah, the people who don't have that confessional grounding, who don't have the grounding in the Reformed tradition, are going to be more liable to that version because it's it's all over in American culture. Right. I mean, I don't know all the historical roots to have. I think Christian Smith, I think is his name, has a, a book called like The Bible Made Impossible, and he tries to do some of the historical work to show how this almost expressive individualism mm-hmm. leads to this sort of interpretation. Right. And it ends up infecting everybody including confessional bodies but that's just not how the reformed tradition has thought about it and so, i think the reformed tradition has a wealth of riches and is right yeah yeah I mean, and that's the, like listen i definitely am a guy that likes to pick a team right now that's that's <laughs> that's not you know i like to be me i like to do my own thing but i also like to pick a team and so that can go wrong like being an, an individual can go wrong and just picking a team can go wrong because now mm-hmm. you're my team can do no wrong you know and that sort of a thing but as I began to study, you know, uh, you know, covenant theology, I was going Pado Baptist because mm-hmm. I just wasn't finding an articulation of of covenant theology that was Baptistic that was really persuasive. And the stuff that I would read would be good, but it still was lacking something. And so I cobbled together my own kind of concept of it for a while until. Uh, you know, I started reading really clear articulations of you know. 17th century, uh, 18th century Baptist guys that are writing on covenant theology, you know, from guys through, you know, RBAP and all of that, that would really help me to, I think, get a, a view that I was more comfortable with. But I like, I like looking at confessions because it's like, okay, here's a team. <laughs> what did they articulate? Wow. Uh, you know, I, I look at the Presbyterians and I go, I love so much of what they say. I can't buy it all. But then I look at the second London and I'm like, this is great. This is gold. So I, I, I like I like the confessional thing. I, I, I need the help. I want the support, um, you know, philosophically and all of that. But you said it was not just biblicism. You also said it was something else. There were two things. So, yeah, I was talking about the sufficiency of Scripture. So, the, I mean, they're, they're really inseparable in some ways, but I separate the concepts a little bit. So you'll see oftentimes people will say it, it's the same similar argument. They're just using a different terminology and sort of doctrine for it. So they're going to say, look, if you end up, you know, let's take divine simplicity, for example. Um, a lot of people um, today and in the medieval tradition are going to look back to, say, Thomas Aquinas. He develops this theory of God is pure actuality. I'm not going to even try to explain that. So if you don't know what that means, like, I'm so, it's super complicated. Um, and... I've got, I mean, I think there, you, you don't have to have pure actuality to have divine simplicity. I'll get in trouble for saying that, but I think that's true. I think the pure actuality stuff is probably the way to go, but I'm going to leave all that to the side because that would take us literally like two hours to walk through all that stuff. But people are going to look at that and say, dude, that's not even like close to being in the text of scripture. If you're going to require me to believe that, you are denying the sufficiency of scripture because you are trying to add something in there that's, and you're saying it's necessary to believe that clearly is not anywhere in this Bible. So they're going to say, look, sufficiency is supposed to be, it's got to be in the Bible or it's got to be necessarily contained in the Bible. Now there's a lot of debate ends up being what necessarily contained in the right. Bible ends up meaning. But if you read in the Reformed tradition, they're going to tell, like, which is awesome. Francis Turretin and Herman Bobbing both do this. They both tell you sufficiency of Scripture means this. There's a lot of abuses of this. Let me tell you all the things it doesn't mean. Mm. So sufficiency of Scripture doesn't mean that Scripture contains everything 
said or done by Christ, everything about God. It doesn't contain all of that. I think most people, when you ask them that, like, does the Bible tell us, um, you know, what God was doing before he created the world or something, you know, whatever it be. Like, there's a lot of stuff, clearly, that's not in the Bible. John 20, 30 right. tells you that. Yeah. Books could be contained upon what Jesus said and did that's not there. Uh, sufficiency doesn't mean that everything is taught word for word in Scripture. So you're going to have to use inference to get to things. So if you were a Pado baptist Pado baptism is clearly not taught in Scripture word for word or anything like that. Now, they're going to end up saying, well, look, I can do this logical inference to get there. I respect that. I think you can do those sort of things. I think they're wrong in the inferences they make. But that's not de- denying the sufficiency of Scripture. Right. Right. We Nor all we, we all we all make inferences and we all derive yeah. doctrines by implication. Uh, absolutely, all sorts of doctrines. I mean, you yeah. do that with with anything, whether it's uh, debates about marijuana or debates like, can we smoke pot? Right. Like, clearly, the Bible doesn't talk about pot. It gives you like interpretive ethical principles that you have to put together and use wisdom to figure out what in the world to do with that. There's the same thing with this. So, sufficiency also doesn't mean that the Bible contains exhaustively everything related to the Christian faith. Mm-hmm. So that's a, it that's may a, be. That's a fundamentalistic like perspective yes. that I've seen a million times. Like the Bible has a black and white answer for everything. It's a dictionary or it's an encyclopedia. You can look yes. up. And so there is never any question. And I've, I've sat under pe- preachers like that. That's, that's fundamentalism. Mm-hmm. So, th- I mean, it happens. People will say God is immutable. <sighs> Right. That's, they'll be like, that's totally false. Look at Genesis 6. He changed his mind. <laughs> like, clearly, you're denying the Bible if you want to affirm some classical theism. We're going to say, hold on. That's a really simplistic way to read the Bible. Right. It's super simplistic because you can go a couple chapters later and it's going to say, God is not a man mm. that he should change his mind. Exactly. Okay, so we either A, have a contradiction on our hands, or B, we actually have to use our heads. Right. Now, I'm not saying that people are not you know, right. trying to do intellectual process. But I do think it's it's important to draw out the distinction that classical theism isn't simply just saying like, yeah, let me drop this over the text. Mm-hmm. It's trying to say, I think not everything about God is explicitly in the Bible. We've got to do some work. He's, he, it, our job isn't just to parrot and repeat exactly the text of Scripture. It's to actually do the process of theology. And that's mm-hmm. consistent with how the Reformed tradition has thought about it. Right. How the er, like the early church, how the medieval tradition thought about it. It's only when you get to this almost like American fundamentalistic, like you said, spirit, wherein we say we can't do any of those things. That that's that's going to corrupt scripture in some sense. Mm. That's not what sufficiency of scripture. If you want to go to the confession, it's going to tell you that the holy scripture is the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. And then it says, although the light of nature and the works of creation and providence do so far manifest goodness, wisdom, power of God, etc. The point being, it's the only sufficient certain infallible rule. So there's there's two points. Number one, it's the only one that actually has everything within it that you need for these things. Right. The other thing is, um, it's the only sufficient, like rule. So there's nothing that's like a greater rule than that that Mm -hmm. can overrule scripture. It's not denying that there are insufficient, uncertain, and fallible rules that can guide us into understand things. It's not saying that um, Holy Scripture tells you everything that there is to know. It's just saying when it comes to matters of faith, obedience, and saving knowledge, scripture is that only certain, infallible, sufficient rule. There's other stuff that can help you. It's not denying any of those things. Right. It's just marking out how Scripture functions, how the light of nature functions. So I I think there's a lot of confusion on this point. So I've got an article with TGC, which, you know, George Soros paid me a huge amount to write this, which I'm pumped about. So I don't have to do anything. I don't have to work anymore. How do you sleep at night? How do you sleep at night being (laughs) a a liberal and uh, and denying the sufficiency of Scripture and uh, and denying New Coke? I don't know how you live with yourself. Uh, listen, uh, Jordan, man, I, I really, uh, 
appreciate what you're doing. Um, I love your brain. I love your heart. I love your attitude. And uh, and your work uh, is going to be so helpful. It already is. The London Lyceum, you guys can go over there, thelondonlyceum.com. Uh, be sure and check that out. Uh, you can follow Jordan on Twitter. It is uh, at JL Stefaniak. Don't worry about it. Just go to the show notes, doctrineanddevotion.com. <laughs> Find this episode. We'll have all the links for you. John Gill Project. Hey, churches, donate five grand each. Come on. You could probably do it, or a grand. Maybe if you're a real small church, you can put the cup to a grand. Get John Gill in print, all these things. It's going to be really good. Um, is there anything else? Oh, these articles. You're going to give me the links to these articles so I can make sure that oh, I yeah. share them. Uh, TGC. I would read TGC, but I'm afraid I'll, you know, I'll, I'll get uh, liberal cooties or something. I don't know. I don't know what people, people are always saying all kinds of crazy things. But, man, uh, we appreciate you. And if you guys uh, like this, be sure and give Jordan a follow. Hit him up with some questions. If you have any feedback for us or you want to engage, you can hit us up on Twitter or Instagram, at Doc and Devo. You can hit our website, DoctrineAndDevotion.com. And, of course, we've got merch, hoodies, sweatshirts, all that stuff at JoFoStore.com. That's J-O-F-O Store.com. And, of course... If you want to support the podcast, you can uh, subscribe. You can become an all-access subscriber right in your podcast listening device. You can probably scroll down, see the link, hit it right there, or go to doctrineanddevotion.com slash all-access. Jordan, thanks for coming on, man. Yeah, it's a pleasure. 